It's a pleasure for me uh, to be here uh, this afternoon. Uh, so I'm French, you can hear it with my uh, accent. Uh, despite the fact I'm here living since eight years around, so I can't get rid of this uh, bloody French accent. Um, so I'm 37 and uh, I'm living in Singapore for eight years. Uh, I've been traveling quite extensively for work and pleasure, but uh, in 2018, I achieved uh, a childhood uh, dream, uh, which I uh, advise everyone in this room to, uh, uh, to try to reach it also, if they have one. So uh, I'm gonna speak about this mountain here. Um, I took this picture to, uh, to start the introduction because it's a picture taken from a plane. So it gives a, a good understanding of uh, the height of this mountain. So Everest is almost at 8,900 meters, which is roughly the altitude of a cruising plane. But you have to go there walking. So it's, a, it's kind of a challenge. Uh, I'm gonna give you some uh, um, key, key facts about Everest. Uh, so the main challenge of Everest, climbing Everest, is actually the, the wind. Um, most of the year, you get the jet stream uh, coming from um, um, Antarctica, going down and hitting the Himalayas. And you have only two uh, weather windows uh, to, climb, to climb Everest. One is in May and the other one is in November. Obviously, in November, it's too cold. Uh, it's, very, it's extremely cold most of the year reaching minus 40, so if you include the wind, you can, uh, you can have effective uh, um, temperature below, 100, below 60, 70 degrees. So it's very hard to, uh, uh, to climb during this period. You have a huge lack of oxygen. So at the summit, you have about 25 to 30% of oxygen. So imagine you have to take three breaths to have the equivalent of one here. Uh, man, meanwhile, you are, uh, you are climbing. So it's another huge challenge. So we use uh, supplemental oxygen to try to uh, lower this effect. And maybe with the use of the oxygen, you, you go maybe above 50% 50, 50 of oxygen when you breathe. So it it's still remains a, a big challenge. Uh, so far, about uh, 5,000 people have climbed Everest uh, since, uh, uh, since uh, 60 years now. And uh, about 100, I uh, might be the 112 French to have climbed Everest. 13 Singaporean have submitted also. And uh, it's, it's a deadly mountain, unfortunately. Not the most uh, dangerous, but uh, as we are so many to uh, attempt it, uh, we have um, unfortunately a 6% uh, death rate. Uh, 200 people have climbed without oxygen, so it's really a uh, few of them. You need to be uh, built differently to climb without oxygen. Um, yeah, it's a funny, funny uh, figure. So you spend on average every day 10,000 calories uh, at base camp and above. Uh, maybe during a normal day today, you will have spent maybe 1,500 calories. 
So it's, uh, it's, it's extremely hard to maintain uh, strength over there. You need to eat a lot. Uh, even if you're not hungry, you need to eat. You need to eat a lot of carbs. Uh, and on summit day, you actually spend 20,000 calories. So I'm going to explain you. My chief of expedition used to tell me when, we arrived, when I arrived to base camp, he told me, Paul, you have already done half of the job. The main challenge is to arrive to base camp. Obviously, after, it's another challenge. But to reach to, to base camp, you need to, uh, to go through a long journey. My journey started when I was a kid, when I read this book. You might know it, uh, actually written by Maurice Herzog, a uh, French uh, climber. He, climbed, he was the first guy to climb uh, with Lachnal, uh 8,000 meters, Annapurna, which remains today the most dangerous mountain on Earth with K2. Uh, so it was an amazing uh, achievement. Uh, he lost a lot over there, but he was uh, one of the most amazing story on earth. His book has been sold 20 million. It's one of the most epic um, adventure on earth today. Um, when, I, when I read this book, I told myself that one day I, I will be willing to, uh, to climb 8,000. So it happens that Everest is one of the easiest 8,000 to climb, not the easiest, but one of the easiest. So I told myself, let's, let's, let's do it. Um, year after year, I, uh, I was doing a lot of climbing, but I kind of lost this, uh, this target, but keep it in my mind. Um, I'm going to speak to you about this project I, uh, I've done after my, uh, uh, my first working experience. Uh, I decided with a friend to, um, to cross uh, from Beijing to Paris on a motorbike. And I want to share this story because with this story I learned something uh, very important, is to never take a no for an answer. Um, and it's quite important when you, when you want to try uh, to climb Everest because you, you get a lot of challenge, a lot of people are trying to tell you not to do it. And um, so when we, when we started this uh, journey, we, uh, we faced a lot of challenge. We, we went on blogs trying to get some information about how feasible was it to, uh, uh, to leave uh, China with Chinese bikes, as a foreigner to own a Chinese bike, uh, to cross some uh, uh, exotic countries such as Turkmenistan, Iran, etc. is a Chinese bike. And most of the answer was no go. You're never going to succeed to do it. Um, so at a certain stage, we decide just to close the computer and, uh, and just to try it. And uh, uh, thankfully, we, uh, we succeed to do it. We, uh, we managed to pass the borders. We managed to, uh, uh, to pass all the challenges that were uh, uh, facing this uh, long journey. We took, it took us a lot of time. We got blocked in a, in a border for almost a month. It um, was, was a big journey, but really this, this teach me really to never give up. And also one thing it teach me also is to be very patient. Uh, this bike is a 125cc. We were driving maybe at 50 kilometers per hour and we, we drove 18,000 kilometers. So when you start your journey and you are in the suburb of Beijing and you tell yourself, uh, I'm gonna need to basically cross uh, half of the planet, it's you pass through uh, some stage of, <laughs> you get scared first, and after you realize, look, just think step by step. And that's actually what I applied when I, go to, when I went to Everest last year. Uh, you really need to, to think step by step, because if you look at the big picture, it's just impossible, uh, and, and you lose uh, confidence. So that, that was a big, uh, big step forward, and I learned a lot from this journey. The last uh, pillar, I would say, who brought me to, uh, to do this, uh, this trip is this picture. This picture uh, was taken by Valérie. Valérie, she's French. She's my mentor. She brought me uh, basically to Everest. Uh, she climbed Everest in 2012. She's uh, living actually in Singapore. She was supposed to do the talk today. <laughs> and um, 
When I saw this picture, when she showed me uh, on our way back uh, in 2013, this picture, and um, I understood, so this is a, basically the shadow of Everest on uh, Nepal. And imagine all the summits over there are above 6,000 6, uh, meters at least. Uh, and this, so this is a shadow of Everest at the sunrise. So the sunrise being uh, uh, east on the Tibetan side, you, uh, you have this shadow uh, which appears during a few minutes. And when I saw this picture, I say, wow. I, I got totally amazed. And, um, and I told her, I want to see that live. I want to see it. Uh, and I, so I was starting to, to discuss with her. And I told her, look, I don't have the, uh, I mean, it's climbing Everest is a dream. Of a, it's maybe 20, 25 years I, I didn't thought about it. But it's actually a dream I had when I was a kid. And she looked at me and she told me, look, Paul, if it's a dream, just do it. So, the, and suddenly I say, shit, she's right. So let's, let's start the journey. So this was in 2013. And um, so I decided to go. And few challenges came through, the, uh, through this uh, journey. First um, was my capacity to do it. So few, I had few challenges. Um, so I was not really experienced climber at high altitude. I only climb um, uh, Alps, French Alps, or so not above 4,000, uh, 4,500 meters maximum. So I was already having this challenge: is um, does my body is gonna uh, accept this kind of uh, uh, height? Um, after my my weight, it was a huge challenge. So I play rugby, I'm 105 kg uh, back in the day. It's extremely um, heavy for this kind of uh, stuff. Actually lost 13 kg on a, uh, during the six weeks uh, this year. Uh, I have asthma, uh, so a lot of challenge. And uh, Valerie thankfully introduced me to a chief of expedition who uh, uh, kindly uh, believed in me and um, took me for, um, uh, for um, a session, I would say, in Nepal. Uh, he brought me in 2013 uh, to test my physical capacity at high altitude. And uh, it went very well. And uh, he decided to took me in 2014. So that's what happened in 2014. Unfortunately, uh, the most, the, unfortunately, the biggest tragedy on Everest happened that year. Uh, I was on, at base camp when uh, an ice fall um, fell on, uh, on 16 uh, uh, Sherpas, uh, 13 died, and uh, they finally decided to close the mountains that year. So it was a, uh, a huge tragedy anyway. Nobody had really the, the willingness to, uh, to go up that year. It was too many, too many uh, uh, death people. But I was definitely uh, willing to go back there. So uh, here we go. Four years later, um, I succeed to ramp up, get some money, find some sponsor, and uh, finally rent with kind of almost the same team as in, uh, in 2014. So uh, that's the beginning of the journey. You have to uh, land in this uh, uh, airport, which is one of the uh, smallest uh, uh, airfield in, uh, on Earth, actually. It's, it's really a, a challenge to, uh, to land over there. So this is Lukla. Um, and you start your journey with, uh, with one week going up to, uh, to base camp, which is at 5,400 meters. So it's a beautiful journey. Um, you, 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 you spend time. You need to acclimatize. Your body needs to uh, acclimatize to the altitude. So you, you go very slowly. Uh, and it's just beautiful. I actually really advise to uh, anyone here to, uh, to go to, uh, at least to, to base camp. It's a beautiful uh, journey. <coughs> so that's, you, you can see the, the difference of uh, uh, nature surrounding. So here we are uh, uh, on the last day before reaching, uh, reaching base camp. So base camp will be seated over there and Everest is here. You can see the face of Everest. You can see the wind already. Uh, still a lot of wind blowing. So you're going to arrive here. Uh, the idea is to arrive uh, mid of April and to wait 
that the weather window open, meaning the weather window is just that this wind kind of disappear and uh, you get a window that depending on the year can be for one day, two days, up to this year was a wonderful year. We had 10 days of weather window. So you spent uh, weeks doing acclimatization process. So that's base camp. Uh, that's my tent where I slept uh, almost six weeks and above. Uh, it's, it's not that uh, comfortable. And uh, nights get very, very cold, uh, above, like below minus 10 degrees easily. Uh, during the day, actually, it's fantastic when the sun uh, is blowing. It's, uh, you are uh, with your T-shirt. And this is the mess tent where I spent a lot of time playing chess and card with, uh, uh, with the rest of the expedition. So we were eight uh, people, um, climbers, and uh, about 10 Sherpas and the chief of expedition. So that's a beautiful view uh, by night, actually. Uh, it's beautiful. So that's the starting of the process. So this is a puja. It's a, a religious uh, celebration uh, where the monk uh, is uh, blessing uh, our expedition. Uh, so after this uh, blessing, we can uh, start to go above base camp. So it's, you need to respect this process. All the Sherpas are taking it extremely seriously. Uh, so it's, uh, you see, we are drinking beers. It's part of the process. <laughs> and I can tell you one beer, you, you get pretty high already. <laughs> so that's all the gear. So um, how do we go to the top of the world? So this is base camp just where I took the picture, uh, where we did the puja. So this is the ice fall, the very famous ice fall, uh, which is the most dangerous part of the journey. So that's one of the reasons a lot of people decide to climb from the other side of Everest, from the Nepali side, from the north face. I wonder myself after the, the incident of uh, uh, 2013 if I if I rather climb from the north side but um, I got a non straight answer from uh, uh, from my chief of expedition he told me that, that you don't have helicopters uh, choppers uh, on the other side so if you have an issue it's uh, it's it's extremely hard to uh, evacuate you uh, whereas uh, since the um, tragedy of uh, 95 you might have read the book into thin air uh, the first chopper uh, was able to reach camp to 6,400 meters. So basically you can get some uh, rescue uh, up to 6,4. And the other reason is that above uh, camp 2, you are going straight to uh, the Lhotse, which is uh, uh, another huge mountain. I think the third mountain in the world in terms of size. And it's extremely um, uh, steep. It's above uh, 45 degrees and also here. So if you have an issue above, it's actually quite easier to bring you down uh, just by pulling you down with a rope. Whereas uh, the north uh, side, as you can see, is uh, not as uh, uh, steepy, so harder to bring down uh, unconscious body. Voila. So that's why I decided to go back to uh, the south face uh, this year. So you reach camp one at uh, 6,000 meters. So you have to pass this uh, uh, glacier. I'm gonna show you some picture. It's very challenging because here you have, uh, w that's why they call it the ice fall because you have a uh, huge serax surrounding the, the face of the glacier. So constantly every day uh, when the heat start to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to ramp up, a piece of ice fell. And uh, that's where it's become very challenging. Not talking about the crevasse over there. Uh, so camp one, camp two at 6.4. Then you go to uh, uh, the Lotse face. You reach 7,200 uh, meters. Uh, I reach there. So our expedition um, strategy is to go there 
without oxygen. So you reach 7.2 without oxygen. And after you, uh, you start to use uh, ox south coal, 8,000 meters and the summit. So obviously you don't do that from uh, uh, one straight. You need to do rotations. You need to acclimatize your body. Uh, you need to create uh, red cells in your blood. Um, and it's, so you need to take a lot of time to acclimatize. And it took me, it took us about uh, three weeks to get fully acclimatized. So that's a picture I took, so it's exactly the same uh, as you can see. You can see the face of Everest, uh, it's black. Why? Because again of the wind. Uh, the wind is blowing most of the year and it's just blowing the, uh, the snow. So that's uh, the, f the first time I went to, uh, on, the, on the ice fall. So you can see over there the base camp. Uh, you need to leave uh, extremely early because of the cold. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, snow, the, um, the ice remains very hard, so it's easier to walk. And also, as I say, less risk of uh, ice fall. Uh, so you're on, you're on rope uh, all the time because you have, it's surrounded by crevasse. So that's the kind of uh, uh, stuff we have to pass. Oh, no, that's me here. <clears throat> so we spent about the first time I took maybe, yeah, still trying to smile. <laughs> that's a fake smile, guys. <laughs> because over there, you don't, you don't wanna, you don't wanna look at it. So and you actually you, you cross leather with crampons, which make it even harder. And um, you don't wanna fail. You have ropes, but. Yeah, at 100 kg, I want to try just to test the, the Zeus rope. So uh, that's one of the biggest stress you get. And actually, many people give up. Uh, and I tell you, they spend a lot of money to be there. They are ready. But laser crossing is huge stuff mentally to pass. So all this process, all this is um, prepared by... Uh, the Sherpas, uh, what we call them the, the icefall doctors. So they are paid by the entire expeditions uh, because you have one way up. So all the expedition pay some guys just to take care of the way to Camp One because every night as it is a glacier, it's moving. So you have some lasers from one day to another that fell. You have some ice that fell. So constantly you have to maintain uh, and it's, that's why it's, it's really dangerous to pass there. So you need to go fast. Uh, you don't talk over there. You, you really, you move your ass quick uh, because <laughs> honestly, it's, it's kind of, it's really scary. So you leave at 3 a.m. And uh, the first time it took me nine hours to reach Camp One. This is Camp One. So you start to be on the, on the um, uh, Kumbu Valley. Uh, so, uh, sorry, the Western Kum. Uh, so it's kind of a valley uh, that go up to uh, Lotse face. And it's getting extremely hot during the day there. So it's, it's also the, the one of the reasons you are spending so much calories because your body go from cold to hot uh, constantly. So that's, that's a Lotse face and that's a f uh, the face of Everest. And you can see here all the crevasses that you will need to pass to go to Camp 2. Uh, so that's a reverse uh, picture from above of um, this Camp 1. So it's just beautiful. The scenery is just amazing. You, aside the, the, the effort, the constant tiredness you have, uh, the difficulty to breathe, uh, uh, the tiredness because you don't sleep well over there. My first night at 6,000 was a nightmare. Uh, you have spasma, you don't sleep, basically. Um, it's really enjoyable. It's, it's uh, amazing sceneries, amazing sceneries. So that's uh, more leather, even more there. <laughs> so here is three in a row. Uh, really challenging. Uh, that's some vertical uh, crevasse to cross. <coughs> So when people say rest is not technical, I might say they, they, they are wrong. Uh, it's, it's, it's not 
it's not an easy one to do as an alpinist. <coughs> so that's on the way to Camp 2. That's Camp 2. On the way to so reaching the Lotse face, uh, you can see it's getting really steepy over there. You can see the wind blowing. Uh, so this is on my second rotation. My first rotation, the idea was to touch Camp 2. I w went down, rest. The second rotation, this one was the idea was to touch uh, Camp 3, which is uh, over there. It took me uh, two tries to reach there uh, because, again, of the uh, acclimatization process. I, you, your body really gets stronger uh, rotation after rotations. You feel it. And you, I guess I was losing a lot of weight quickly. At this kind of altitude, your, uh, your body is not functioning very well and you lose weight. And uh, actually it's good because obviously you have uh, less weight to, uh, to carry. Uh, because over there you have already only 50% of oxygen maybe. And uh, without uh, supplemental oxygen, it's, uh, it's really challenging to, uh, uh, to breathe. So that's how steepy it is. Uh, that's the camp three is uh, behind this, uh, this arc. So that's taken between my legs, so really to give you uh, an idea how steep it is. So that's a view uh, picture I took uh, when I actually slept at camp three. Uh, to go to the top. Uh, so I left, uh, I left base camp, which is behind these uh, clouds, uh, reach camp one there, camp two, S rest two days, and uh, we went up to camp three. Um, here really, it was starting to get stressful. Uh, we, unfortunately, we lost already a, a friend that was staying at our, uh, a camp. Um, I mean, yeah, you can you can feel the risk over there. You 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 are prepared mentally. I was prepared mentally to uh, to go to see dead people, to potentially die there. But when it's happening and it's um, very close to you, it's uh, it's another story. But you remain focused. Uh, you need to be focused because you you need to save your ass here. So that's uh, where you switch on oxygen. Uh, it helps a lot. Even if it's a, just a tiny flow of oxygen, because the idea is that the, the bottle uh, can bring you oxygen for about five hours. So you need to do it like uh, carefully, not like when you are uh, diving, uh, where a bottle lasts for 40, 40 minutes. Here really, it's a, it's a sh really small flow but making a huge difference. I felt much better. So we left. So the critical journey really started that morning. We, le we left at uh, 4 a.m. Camp 3 at 7.2. So that's the way to Camp 4, which is behind there. Uh, so you see a lot of people, uh, <coughs> but actually it was uh, manageable. Uh, just before this I took this picture, we saw a body of a guy uh, who died uh, by exhaustion. Uh, so it's, it's really becoming, um, you, get, you get surrounded by uh, death and you, you understand that you are in an in unwelcome place in the world. So this is the summit of Everest. This is maybe, I took this picture uh, late morning. Uh, I had a pretty, pretty good day that day. It took me, it took me uh, 10 hours to reach Camp 4. Uh, that's a picture just before uh, reaching the South Core. So you can see the camp, camp 3 there. You can still see people climbing up. And you can see uh, uh, all the crevasses there that you have to, to pass. Really dangerous. Uh, camp 2 here and Camp 1 is over there. And this is Nupse. Uh, beautiful picture, you can see the crowd. You really start to get pretty high. Uh, that's when you reach Camp 4. Uh, so we reach Camp 4 at 2 p.m. Uh, it's quite dirty actually, it's, uh, it's really annoying, but uh, uh, yeah, Sherpas, uh, locals really don't 
really take care of it. And when it's really blowing, uh, actually you can have a lot of tents getting damaged. Um, but overall, the this mountain is quite clean. I mean, I was expecting worse, to be totally honest with you. So here, we try to rest uh, before the last push. So the last push is a push to the summit, and you have to do it by night. Because by doing it by night, if you have an issue, you can try to fix, to fix it during the day, the following day. So everyone uh, leave by night. I know I will be uh, slow because uh, uh, as I'm heavy, uh, I, I knew I will be slow. So I decided with my Sherpa, we are on one to one with your Sherpa. Uh, I decide to leave at 8, p uh, at 8 p.m. So you don't sleep there because you are uh, on the death zone. So actually your body is, uh, is dying, is in, uh, your cells are dying. Uh, you can't stay long in this kind of altitude. Uh, and your body ca cannot um, relax. Uh, it's a very strange feeling. You, my brain was really not functioning well. Uh, you really try to do the basic, is just drinking water. So your Sherpas and yourself prepare water uh, to try to, uh, uh, to live at least with, uh, with two liters of water um, for, the, for the last push. So that's the last push. So you leave uh, South Cole, where I took the picture, and you start a climb extremely steep, uh, above 45, 50 degrees. Uh, you reach the idea to reach the balcony, and that's something I was not told, and uh, was actually a big challenge for me, is that it's so steep over there that you cannot actually rest. You, you don't find any place to sit down and rest. Uh, so that night was uh, the hardest uh, experience I, uh, um, I endured of my entire life. Uh, this section actually was uh, extremely critical. Um, so I left there at 8 p.m. and I reached the balcony at 3 a.m. in the morning. So it took me only, uh, uh, it took me seven hours to do 450 meters. It's extremely slow. Uh, to give you an idea, um, you guys would climb 600 meters an hour in, a, in, the, in the French Alps. So 10 times slower. You, each, each step is a huge effort. Your body is blowing apart. I like to say that on this kind of altitude, it's like driving a car on the highway full speed at the third gear. Your, the engine is just blowing apart. So that's why many people die over there. It's just that the body cannot stand anymore. Your uh, breath is getting, uh, um, your, your, uh, it's, it's, you're breathing, but you don't feel you have oxygen getting into your body. And your heart is just uh, pumping, not for 10 minutes, not for 30 minutes, for 12 hours. So I reached the balcony uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning. My, uh, so that's where it's, it started to go wrong. Uh, it's usually the case. Um, so that was already 24 hours. I left Camp 3. Uh, so I was obviously exhausted. Um, and my Sherpa uh, changed my bottle of oxygen. And during this period of 10 minutes where I just uh, turn off my oxygen, I felt my body temperature lost maybe two degrees um, and started to feel extremely cold. My hands, uh, I was uh, having an issue also with my, s I had an electrical system to, uh, to heat my hands and um, the batteries were not anymore working because of the cold. It's maybe minus 25 degrees. Uh, so it's all the problem happen obviously as usual at the same time. And uh, I, um, my Sherpa changed the bottle. He saw that I was uh, starting to uh, uh, not to react properly. So you also your, your brain is, uh, is not functioning well. And I was seated so he urged me to uh, stand up and uh, to go. Uh, so uh, I just 
put some warmers uh, in, my, uh, in my gloves. And um, the issue with the warmers is that you need oxygen for them to, uh, be, to activate and to start to warm uh, because it's a chemical um, stuff. So, and without oxygen, they took about an hour and a half to uh, activate. So during this hour and a half, I lost my hands and I could not even move one finger. So I'm, I told to my Sherpa this issue and uh, he told me, look, I can, uh, I can secure you uh, on the rope. So you are, every 20 meters, you need to unrope, unclip, and reclip uh, to the other rope. Uh, so this was, I was unable to do it. So that moment was really critical. And that's where uh, I really, today everything is fine. I didn't lose my fingers, thanks God. But that's where you go, like you, you find some strengths that you could not have imagined that are in each and every one of us. Even despite the exhaustion, you find some strengths hidden. You hit some doors, you didn't know what was behind this door and you actually cross them and you, and it was no way I, uh, I would give it up. Uh, and maybe that's what they call the summit fever. Uh, I was no way I was going to, uh, to give up. I was ready to lose my fingers actually um, because I was still going up and I had oxygen. So it was critical, but at the end of the day, it's, you go through, uh, it's, it's an amazing experience to go through this critical time. Um, and I will remem remember this, mom this hour, hour and a half all my life. And thanks God, the warmer started to uh, do their effect. I start to find back my hands, uh, get some feelings back. I was painful, but uh, I was so happy because pain me means that uh, my blood was starting to, uh, to feel back again uh, my, uh, my fingers. And um, that's where it became from hell to paradise. Voila, so that's mine. I saw five years, uh, four years earlier the one of Valerie, and that was mine. So I took this picture at the sunrise, and it was just unbelievable. So I, I literally cried there. It was a peak, was uh, the height, the, I would say the, the highest point for me. Uh, it was kind of a, like a gift from Everest. Uh, like, I've done it. Even if I was not at the top, I was, uh, so I felt again a lot of strength and it um, was quite, quite easy to do the rest of the, of the climb. Uh, so that's uh, reaching South Summit. Uh, South Summit is uh, 100 meters below uh, uh, the actual summit of Everest and here you have to pass a ridge which is quite critical. You have three kilometers of void there and 2.5 there. And you have to pass through this step, the famous Hilary step, which is uh, quite famous. Hilary from the name of the guy who climbed the first Everest. Uh, it's, uh, it's a rocky, like three meters uh, vertical climb. So I show this video. I did not took this video, but um, the idea of this video is to give you an idea of the um, uh, of the effort of breathing over there. Maybe we need to let it charge. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's going to be hard. <laughs> but you can see the, the panorama. Uh -huh. Let's try again. Yeah, guys, what, what kind of equipment do you have <laughs> at ASEC? <laughs> Students are not paying enough? <laughs> um, so the, the video 
you, you could hear it, but it's even higher over there when, uh, when you reach some uh, critical point. The breath, the breath is, but unfortunately, uh, I, can't, I can't show it. It's, every breath is an incredible effort. So this is a view of, from the summit uh, to Tibet side. So this is Tibet. Uh, you can see a glacier over there. Uh, that's the summit, so we were a few, uh, few of us there. Uh, it's amazing. So the first things you do there is just to, uh, to congratulate your uh, Sherpa. Uh, it's something really important I want to share is without the team, without the Sherpa, it's just impossible to climb. Um, it's a long journey for them. They have to do, uh, they have to climb up a lot of gears for you. Uh, they have to bring the food. They, the, the night I climbed from, uh, for the last push, my Sherpa was uh, lifting three bottles of uh, ox. So, I mean, I, I will uh, always be grateful to this guy. Um, it's really a teamwork. You can't climb Everest uh, without a teamwork. Actually, the, the one of the body I saw there, the Sherpa told me, you see this guy? You try to climb alone and you see the result. So uh, quite pragmatic, but uh, true, I would say. <laughs> so that's the highest selfie uh, on Earth. <laughs> voilà, so that's, uh, I, I, I managed to take out my gloves for, uh, for five minutes. <laughs> So I uh, managed to stay 40 minutes uh, on the top because, uh, because I did not use that much of oxygen, uh, surprisingly. Uh, so I managed to stay 40 minutes on the top of the earth. It was an incredible uh, moment. Um, the only issue is that you still stress because uh, when you reach the top, you only done 50% of the job. You still need to go down. And uh, every maintainer's know that most of the accidents occur on the way down because you're, um, you're weak, you're exhausted. And actually going down is, um, is very uh, hard for the, for the legs. And it took me another 12 hours to go down. Uh, so total, the journey from Camp 3 back to safe, safe tent was 36 hours. Uh, just with a six hour break at uh, Camp 4. Voila, so uh, thanks a lot for listening to me. I just want to share that um, this journey was first uh, a dream. And for me, it's really important to share that with you guys. Uh, you're young, uh, you have uh, so much time in front of you. Don't only think about studying. <laughs> It's a bit strange that I'm saying that uh, here at ESSEC. But uh, take really time to, um, uh, yeah, to try to think of uh, what would be your dream if you don't have one. And uh, yeah, honestly, it might sound stupid, but nothing is, re nothing is impossible. Really, it's, uh, it's just a question of a mindset. Uh, and, uh, and everything is possible. Voila, thanks a lot. Thank you. Merci. Thanks a lot for your time. I just want to do uh, for the students. If you want to join the stage, the four students will prepare the, the questions. One there. One there. Two, three. Merci. Merci, Xavier. Hi. So, thank you for your presentation. Uh, as a matter of we are working this week, uh, but how to live together in 2050. And so, I wanted to ask you a question about the future. And uh, what, do you think, what do you think would still uh, remain to be explored from the world at that time? And what do you think exploring would be in 2050? Is it going to be the same, same challenges or different? Uh, 
thanks. It's a good question. Um, so just speaking about this, maybe this picture, you don't see it well, but I guess 80% uh, of the mountain on Earth have not been climbed. Maybe, I mean, uh, some face. Uh, so there is a lot to explore. Uh, there is a lot of challenge to be uh, still done by uh, your generation, guys. I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, even on, uh, I mean, mountain, ocean, uh, a lot of guys are doing some amazing stuff. Uh, exploration is, a, I think, it's the most uh, fantastic uh, stuff on Earth. That's what made us up to here. It's to explore, to discover. So for sure, in 2050, there will uh, be still stuff to explore. We just have to uh, be careful on uh, how we treat Earth, planet Earth, because there is only one, and uh, it's getting uh, it's getting warm. There is some issues. Uh, I saw on uh, on Everest they have to uh, uh, change the um, the way they approach the mountain. It's getting too crowded over there. There is huge challenge of uh, um, managing a base camp where you have during two months uh, 1,500 people. Uh, imagine uh, going to the toilet, uh, using water, etc. So uh, we need to adapt. We need to change uh, some uh, uh, some way to approach uh, stuff. We have to change because we just simply as that we're getting too many people on uh, on hers. Voilà. Um, so my next my next challenge is uh, is uh, actually uh, um, I'm seated here with my uh, my business partner and uh, <laughs> I uh, I'm focusing on uh, on work we we are entrepreneurs and uh, we want to uh, to bring our company to the to the top of the world <laughs> so that's my next challenge uh, I'm gonna put on hold. Uh, like high expedition. I'm gonna do more, but uh, the issue with, uh, with high altitude climb is uh, you need a lot of time to acclimatize, so you need weeks. Uh, so if you want to go above 7,000, it's at least a, a six weeks journey, so it's hard to take uh, six weeks. Um, to uh, answer your second question, physical preparation is, um, is over there actually it's when you reach uh, camp, uh, base camp uh, that's where most of the preparation start uh, you need to arrive there uh, fit obviously but um, I, I didn't prepare myself uh, so much uh, I play rugby uh, as a sport and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, far enough uh, actually I put, try to put on weight uh, before uh, going there uh, so as to have some uh, fat to burn uh, to the top. Mental uh, preparation, um, I uh, tend myself uh, to, uh, to take, uh, to relax a lot, uh, not to um, um, get stressed by, uh, by the journey. Again, the, the motorcycle uh, trip learned me a lot to, um, to sit down and uh, relax and just uh, uh, take uh, day after day. Uh, when I arrived to uh, base camp and then wh when I was facing uh, uh, the, the summit of uh, Everest and the way I was exhausted already to reach uh, base camp, you, if, you, if mentally you, you, you just st step, step out and, uh, and really relax, it's going to be impossible. Impossible. So you really need to relax and uh, take some uh, high. <laughs> voilà. So, um, uh, give up? No. Uh, so, as I say, I, I, uh, I, 
I mean, at a certain stage, I tell myself, shit, what are you doing here right now? So that's, that's came to my mind uh, when I was not feeling my hands, but uh, I didn't really thought about giving up. And that's what I call, uh, that's what people call summit fever. I think your brain is, uh, is not functioning well. Obviously, at this kind of, uh, if I had, if I was at sea level and I had this issue with my hands, etc., I would have given up for sure. But there I was not. It was six weeks. I was there uh, climbing meter after meters. And, and I think your brain is not functioning well, to be totally transparent. So I, I did not um, give up. After, for, um, for your second question, uh, no, I think it's even, uh, it's even more challenging for you guys because uh, uh, so technology-wise, no, because it's a mental game. Uh, climbing Everest is, uh, I like to say, it's 50% of luck. So you need luck. You need luck with the weather. You need luck with your uh, uh, physical, um, f your body. Don't get sick. Uh, don't get uh, eat wrong food. Um, uh, uh, don't fall into a crevasse. Uh, don't get uh, ice fall on your head. Uh, so that's what I call uh, luck. Also, obviously, the weather needs to be here. Um, and uh, it's at least 30% of mental strength. And the rest is uh, physical and technical uh, capacity. So really, it's a, it's a mental game. So it's just a question of uh, asking yourself if you, are, you will be capable to do it. But uh, as I like to say, if, if you don't try it, you, you will never know if you have this mental strength. Thank you. Uh, question I have is, if you were to climb on Everest again, what would you do differently? And also, as business leaders, we as business leaders, we want to take risks, but how would you advise to overcome that? Overcome the barriers of risk? Okay. Uh, very good question. Um, I think of, I will answer first to the, your second question. <laughs> it's about uh, team, I would say. It's all about the team. Um, to overcome the risk. Uh, climbing Everest, I would have never done it if I would have not had the right uh, chief of expedition first, who trusted me, uh, uh, whereas I never climbed uh, a five or even a 6,000 meter. So it was uh, quite uh, a big decision that he took. He brought me, he tested me. And uh, so this is a chief of expedition. And after, it's all the team uh, behind, all the Sherpas, uh, that uh, enable us to, uh, to go to the top. So it's totally 100% a team work. Uh, and I'm really thankful to all of them because they changed my life. I might never see them again, but that's also the beauty of it is, uh, is just uh, the two mo mo most amazing months of my life. And, uh, and those guys uh, helped me to do it. And they, we come from a totally different uh, a perspective, uh, etc., and that's I think that's the beauty of it. Voilà. And after uh, we do it, if I would have changed something, no, I don't think so because uh, I reached to the top, so that was the end. <laughs> Uh, some guys did it in uh, like the top race guy. They might be able to do it in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Going up and down? Yeah. They are r running guys. And for you? For me, so one day to go to camp two, uh, two days resting, uh, getting ready for the weather window, Sherpas getting ready, blah, blah, blah. And after one day to camp three, and after camp three, to the summit, uh, a bit more than 24 hours. Yeah. And after to go down uh, 12 hours to camp two, and the next day I was base camp, enjoying a good beer. You are, you are, it's it's strange feeling. I think I, I it's oh, it's almost it's what eight months. 
uh, I still have, have not digested yet. Um, I didn't have um, many people say they feel very strange when they come back, etc., and they have a hard time actually. I did not. I was. I really enjoy uh, every moment uh, since the moment I uh, I came down. You have a yeah. You you feel much more uh, uh, confident about yourself. Obviously, um, something changed. There is a before and an after. Totally. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>